Uh, welcome, friends. We're delighted you're here. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for uh, this week's installment uh, of the Kennedy Center Lecture Series on Authoritarianism and its Discontents. We're really delighted today to welcome Baman Bakhtiari uh, uh, from the Baskerville Institute, who will be speaking on understanding the 2022-23 Iran protests, roots, realities, and ramifications. My name is Quinn Meekham. I'm the Associate Director for Research and Academic Programs here at the Kennedy Center. Uh, we have a few announcements for you, some events coming up that uh, may pique your interest and we invite you to participate in. Uh, today at 3 p.m. in this room, uh, we're really pleased to host Kurt Graham. Kurt Graham is the Director of the Truman Presidential Library. Um, and he will be speaking on the origins of the global American century. Uh, Harry Truman's um, post-war world order, uh, and he'll be focusing on some of the contemporary challenges to that uh, post-war world order that developed uh, after World War II under the Truman administration. Um, that should be an engaging event. We invite you uh, here at, at 3 p.m. if uh, you'd like to participate there. Tomorrow, uh, we also have a, a couple of important events. So, uh, the Kennedy Center's uh, Choose to Give campaign uh, is having an open house tomorrow in our advisement center, which is just right down the hallway in uh, 273. Um, from noon, noon to 1, there will be empanadas, uh, and it's kind of a celebration of uh, some of the, the ways in which we benefit students. Um, we invite you to come and give whatever you can uh, to support Global Opportunity Scholarships for our students. Uh, to get them abroad and uh, to make a difference in their lives. Um, also, uh, tomorrow uh, at uh, 2 p.m. in this room, um, we have uh, Francisco Goldman, who's a Pulitzer Prize uh, finalist, uh, who's going to be speaking about Guatemala in the 21st century. Um, he uh, has uh, a, a recent book out called The Art of Political Murder uh, that discusses the murder of uh, a prominent uh, bishop in Guatemala. Uh, so we invite you to uh, that talk tomorrow by Francisco Goldman. Um, and then finally, uh, next week, uh, as part of our regular lecture series, uh, we will be hearing from Amanda Clayton at the University of California at Berkeley. And uh, her topic is Gender Quotas, and the consequences of women's political representation. So that will be next Wednesday at noon in this room. If you have one of these uh, flyers, there's, uh, there's some additional ones available out here. It has the rest of our lecture series. I'll just note that Ruth ben Giot, who is also scheduled to speak next week uh, from New York University, has had to postpone her trip, so we will be rescheduling uh, her talk. She's the author of uh, Strong Men from Mussolini to the present. So we look forward to finding a time to, to also hear from her. But next week's lecture will be by Amanda, Amanda Clayton. Uh, we'd like to begin with an opening prayer today. Ella Johnson, who uh, is studying psychology here at BYU uh, from Washington State, will offer that opening prayer. So Ella. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this day and for the beautiful moisture that we've been able to receive today. We thank Thee for the chance that we have to listen to this presentation today and please bless that it'll enhance our lives and our minds and help us better know how to approach world issues and support those around us. And we thank Thee again for this day and the education that we have the chance to receive here at BYU. And we say things in Jesus Christ, amen. Well, I'm excited um, <clears throat> for our talk today. Uh, I know that many of you uh, have been paying close attention over the last couple of years to the protests that have erupted in Iran. Iran has a long history uh, of, of protest uh, that we'll be exploring a little bit uh, today. Can I just ask by a show of hands, how many of you uh, speak Persian? Excellent. All right. I think this is the biggest crowd of Persian speakers we've got on campus at this moment. Uh, we're really uh, glad that, that you're here. Um, 
It's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Baman Bakhtiari. Uh, he is the executive director of the Baskerville Institute uh, in Salt Lake City, Utah. It's a nonprofit organization that promotes understanding and respect between Americans and Iranians. Um, Dr. Bakhtiari received his PhD in international law and government from the University of Virginia. Um, he's held a range of uh, academic and administrative positions over the course of his career at multiple universities, including the University of Utah, and has published extensively on Iranian culture and politics. Um, he's the author of the book, Parliamentary Politics in Revolutionary Iran, Institutionalization uh, of Factional Politics. Uh, we invite you as you listen and participate uh, to silence your cell phones today um, to avoid any disruptions. We will go until 1 p.m. We anticipate that we'll have uh, at least 20 minutes or so um, for discussion and um, invite you to consider questions you might have for our speaker um, for the Q&A portion um, of our program today. Please join me in welcoming Baman Bakhtiri. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you, Quinn, and thank you, Kennedy Center, for inviting me for this lecture. I'm always um, delighted to be given a talk on Iran because every year I have to update my lecture and I have to read an additional book for it. So I'm always um, geared toward informing people about what is happening in this important country and why is it important that we need to watch it. I also want to welcome our interns from Basketball Institute here, our project manager. We have wonderful interns who speak Persian. همه شما خوش آمدید خیلی خوشحالم از دیدنتون و امیدوارم که از این سخنرانی لذت ببرید. So um, I was invited to give a talk about the protest in Iran from uh, that started from September 2022 and kind of fizzled out uh, by March 2023. Uh, the interesting coincidence is that this lecture comes on the one year anniversary <laughs> of the Iranian protest fizzling out and all the questions raise us today. So today we have the advantage of uh, one year to look back and see what can we learn from that past six, seven months of protest, why those protests happen, and what is it within Iran that encourages more protest and allows more protest despite its government being one of the repressive governments. So today, I want to start by um, giving you a historical perspective about how these protests continue to happen since 1979. The current Islamic Republic itself is a result of a massive protest called Islamic Revolution. The regime that was created in 79 came about because of a massive revolution. So for many Iranians, some of these things that I'm talking to you about looks very average and lame because they were part of this experience. So it is important to keep in mind that when we look at protests today, we have to connect that to the 1979 revolution. Revolutions are not just one-time event. Revolutions, if you have read in your books, classes, revolution is a process is a process that starts with certain uh, significant event in that country, either, for example, by an assassination, by sickness of a ruler, by massive people coming. It starts by an event, and then that process continues. Today, uh, we can confidently say that Iran continues to go through that revolutionary process. The reason is because it has maintained some of the institutions that encourage that process. And then we have to ask the question, why? Why did the rulers of Iran decide to do this? I mean, they could have gone on many other options. They could have gone on a uh, Chinese option. They could have gone on a uh, North Korean option. They could have gone on a simple Middle Eastern option of authoritarianism. Why did they decide that it is important for their mission, their revolutionary ideology, and the system they want to replace to maintain a part of the revolution going. So it just explains to you in one paragraph that the Islamic Republic faces 
recurring public dissent related to economic, social, political issues, with protests being met with differing levels of uh, state suppression. So one factor is that economic issues have not been resolved. Economic issues have gotten worse. And this way, continuing with the revolutionary message, continuing with the revolutionary vision, somehow keeps the loyalty of the people that you're sacrificing for the cause of the revolution, even if your economic situation has uh, brought you down. Also, you have to consider the role of the United States. They argue for their people. It's the United States that doesn't want us to develop. They call the United States the great Satan. And here, um, United States in turn calls the Iranian regime radical terrorist regime. So we have this thing called a mutual Satanization going on. And where this thing is going to get, we don't know yet. But it's important to keep in mind this kind of a 79 to 23 protest. Now, um, as I mentioned, um, four factors explain what I call the simmering tensions. Four factors that today can explain a little bit about what happened last year and may happen again. And the, face, the first uh, important factor is that there is a contradiction. There is a contradiction, tension, between the Iranian society and the Iranian government. The Iranian government, as it is constructed, structured, has not been able to keep up with the growth of the Iranian society. A young society, eager for change, educated, with women having major roles, successes, etc. The regime has not been able to find a way to navigate the desires of the Iranian society into its politics. So there is always this simmering tension. The regime uh, governs by justifying its structure religiously, and in this case, Islam. Now, don't forget it is called Islamic Republic. And later in my lecture, you will know that I've I have a better term for them. I've called them an impossible republic. And this Islamic republic that they have created, how republican is it? How Islamic is it? And they created the Islamic republic because they want to come up with a central role of a figure of a supreme leader, similar to a religious imam, similar to a grand mufti, that this person can guide the society simply by issuing a fatwa simply coming out using his name. And that, con that, that structure um, creates a kind of, again, tension. Now, there is a tension between elected institutions that, like parliament, president, city councils, and unelected institutions, like the supreme leader. So first you have this tension between Iranian society and government. Now within the Iranian government, you have a tension. You have, all, you have this important post that people elect and they like the president, and then the president is not capable to make changes. And the Iranian constitution specifically mentions that a president elected by the Iranian people has to be approved by the supreme leader. So that itself is an example of this structure that we're talking about. So I mentioned the um, stark contrast and also the fact that this inherent structure creates what I call a pressure cooker. It is a structure that is constantly boiling, constantly may explode. Because structurally speaking, elected offices, unelected offices are intention. Society-wise, the societal components are intention. In, on the whole, the governing system cannot manage it because they're already intention within themselves. So these are important factors to remember. Um, now, you look at protests in Iran, um, I thought it's better to put into some uh, context for you that practically every year there have had protests in Iran. Now, the issues have changed from the first protest of March 79, actually interesting, 45 years ago, and it was led by the women who wanted to object to the hijab. And isn't it interesting that the protest movement of September 2022 started by women again? So here is the, that recycle that we talked about, that I mentioned to you. So that issue of hijab has not been resolved. 
And for 45 years, it keeps going. And it was an issue in 79, and it's still an issue today. Why is it an issue today? Because um, many of you speak Persian, probably have not been to Iran. I wish we had a situation that we could make it possible for you guys to go to Iran. What you will see in Iran today is that when you arrive in the Imam Khomeini airport in Iran, and before arriving, you will not see any symbols of Islam anywhere. Not on the Iran air, not on the people, on the passengers at Iran air, not even in the airport. The first symbol of Islam that you see in that country is the scarf, is the hijab. As soon as you arrive, you see women with hijab. That is the first symbolic expression of that Islamic Republic. So hijab is critical to the regime because without it, it will lose legitimacy. It is critical to the opponents of the regime because they want to get rid of it. They know that that's how you do it. So that's why we had a protest in 79, and we continue to have it today with a hijab. Uh, the only thing that has changed, if you go on the internet pictures, women have become better to define what we mean by hijab. In 79, they wore this hijab that covered all their faces here. In 2002, their hijab is pretty much a negotiated piece of paper that goes all the way down here. And you have the morality police to stop him, fix it, they will fix it. As soon as the guy goes away, they put it back on again. So this kind of struggle back and forth is an important symbolic struggle and the role of women. And then in June 1988, we had a major protest in Iran because this is an institutional conflict. An elected president at that time, Awal Hassan Banisad, was removed by revolutionary courts and revolutionary guards. And people came on the streets, and I know many people are so used to the word impeachment in this country, but Iran also stands as having one of the first impeachments in the Middle East. They impeached this president in the parliament, and they impeached this president for lack of loyalty to Islam, lack of loyalty to the leader. So they set this stage that elected officers, who cares how many million people voted for you, you're tested by your loyalty to the religious leader. And if you just look at the others, um, started political protests, the rest of them are all economic. Protests in Mashhad in 1991 over the uh, subsidies, protests in Qasvin in 1994 over the changes of US, uh, Iranian government, withdrawing some welfare programs, and all the way um, in 1999, which was one of the major protests that um, um, some of the radical elements of the regime attacked the student dormitory at the University of Tehran because that, that group of students were very liberal. They were talking about it. The, this, uh, they're called Hezbollah, radical forces, attacked that dormitory, killed some students, and that initiated what is called the student protest in 1999. That student protest lasted for seven days nonstop in the country. And then... <clears throat> Then we had the protests in 2009 for something that, again, back to the presidential election, the presidential election in 1981, 2009 again, about a president that was elected but was not in line with the supreme leader. And it, that became known as the Green Revolution. For months and months, people came to the streets, demanded that illegitimate so-called president Ahmadinejad must removed is Musavi the legitimate president, and that legitimate president still is under house arrest, and it's fascinating that the regime has not prosecuted them, has not taken them to, this, to any court, it's kept them on house threat for this many years. Then, again, more economic situation and fuel prices. So what do you see here? You see protests starting for political reasons, uh, merge with economic protests then economic protests don't get anywhere. You have more protests for political reasons. Then we go back to the economic reasons. So it is a back and forth that we have to uh, pay attention to. And the reason this is happening is that in the West, unfortunately, United States, uh, uh, we have a hard time understanding Iran. We have a hard time understanding Iranian government. And we also have a hard time understanding what is this government doing? 
Uh, he keeps going through these demonstrations, but yet comes out. Okay, so that, that misunderstanding we could address later on, that is a huge factor here, that why we continue to misunderstand Iran. And a broader question is that why do we continue to miss the forest for the trees in the Middle East? We continuously uh, are not able to put Iran as a Middle East context to understand its role. We either look at Iran and Israel as enemy, we either look at US coming. So we completely miss the whole picture. That is actually related to the first question. We miss the whole picture of Iran. And because of that uh, predisposition to missing pictures, we miss the whole picture about the Middle East. So Iran is an important component of our perception of that region. The way we perceive Iran is really the way we perceive Middle East. And the two have an interactive uh, narrative. So to summarize for you, um, we've talked about elected institutions, minimum authorities, we talked about unelected institutions, ultimate authorities. We talked about factions who are completely competing with each other because there are no political parties. And finally, we talked about state society relations in tension. And what that means is that um, we have to look at the governing structure of the Islamic Republic, or I call it the impossible republic. If you look at the simple, um, governing structure of this system. You will see a supreme leader in the middle. Now, for those guys who speak in Persian, they call him Vali Amre Muslimin. Now, if your Persian is very good, that, is, that doesn't mean supreme leader of Iran. They call him Vali Amre, supreme leader of the whole Muslim world. <laughs> that is his title, Vali Amre Muslimin. And then you have this kind of a strange council called Guardian Council. Now, what are they guarding against? There's a Guardian Council. Now, this Guardian Council of clerics, senior clerics, um, uh, half appointed by the Supreme Leader, half appointed by the Parliament, that Guardian Council watches legislations. They make sure every legislation that Parliament passes, it is in accordance with Islam. And that's why in Iran, they call their representative body a parliament, not a legislature. The difference between a parliament and legislature is that parliaments are not strong in legislating. They are strong in political management. Here, when they created this, they intentionally did not call their representative body a legislature. They called it a parliament because they didn't want to give it any power. So you have this parliament. So if you look at all the blue part, those are all elected um, offices. You have those darker parts. You have those unelected offices. And those unelected offices pretty much control the country. And there is a tension between the gray and the blue. And that tension fits within that state society tension again. So it's magnified. Um, <clears throat> now, let's look at, um, now that we have a picture of the Iranian governing system, let's look at a picture of Iranian society now. See how difficult that is, that, that is for that political system where we talked about. Now, many people look at the population of Iran, 85 million. Do you know what was the population of Iran when the revolution happened in 79? 32 million. 32 million population in 79, 85 million. Why? Because the regime promoted more children more people, because the regime engaging conflict in wars wanted more young soldiers. So now they're stuck with this big population. Now, 60% are under 25. What does that tell you? 60% don't even know the Islamic Revolution of 79. They don't know what happened. It's like a textbook thing to them. And that is, but then look at the urban population. Uh, this is an important information. 74% of the Iranian population is urban. What percentage was urban in 1979? 38%. 38% urban in 79, 74%. And finally, look at the female population here. That's a huge element. The female population that the regime wants to impose the hijab on, they have to deal with 45 million people. <laughs> and then finally, 
university students, because as much as I love my university students and my students at universities, one thing is different uh, about you guys and the students in Iran. The students in Iran are so politicized, so political. If you run into somebody majoring in mechanical engineering, he will quote Tocqueville to you. And if you're running into somebody majoring in biology, he will come and quote constitutionalism to you. There is this amazing merging of scientific fields, everything overwhelmed with political issue. And political issues, if you notice some of the students who are out in the streets, they're all part of the science programs. The Sharif University is a totally technical university, but they were out in the streets. So science, technology, knowledge has also made the population more um, 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 aware of their potentials. They know that their potential is strong, so they have a very strong opinion. Now, not too many people know about the number of universities in Iran. Before the revolution, we had about 30, maybe 31 universities in Iran. And to get into a university, you have to go through this national test, very competitive, all that. Today, there are 1,600 universities and colleges in Iran. Now, think about, they cannot even, the government, take care of some of the issues. They have now 1,600 universities in Iran. At least 20% are online universities. At least 30% uh, do not require an admission test. Major universities now, every time you just go look at the map of Iran typing a university, you see them in every city, every village, everywhere. So that expansion has also created this uh, uh, society of state tension. And most of the business majors, medical sciences, and also there's a large number of Iranian students abroad. Now, I was part of that Iranian students who came before 79, when I came to this country, I came in 1970 for my high school, and I carried this uh, fantastic I-20 form that I had to show to everybody. And when I arrived, people just said, wow, you come from Iran? They didn't even know what Iran, they didn't know why. By the time the revolution happened, do you know how many Iranian students were in the United States? 60,000. Iran had the largest number of foreign students in the United States, 60,000. So just com um, combine that 60,000 students, combine with the domestic students going on, combine their ability to use social media, technology, whatever, they have a, they have a serious issue on their hand here. And they have a serious issue on their hand because before the revolution, the Shah's government wanted to create students to become their loyalties. Now they wanted to create students to become their loyalties. Now they've created these millions of students who are loyal to none of them. <laughs> And that's why in Iran today, there is no chance ever of monarchy coming back. Anybody looks at the protest movement, we're going to talk about it. All the opposition groups that claim to be protest movement's leaders, they have no reputation inside Iran. That's why one reason that we can talk about it, the question and answer, these protest movements fail because they don't have a clear leaders. And the second thing is this large number of student population, and also with the women. Um, men have certain grievances, economic jobs. Women have a very important grievance about imposition of a job. Now, no matter what position you are in, whether you are a physician or you're a nurse, you are tied with that hijab. And they're going to stick with each other. They're going to stick with each other because they see uh, that Durkheimian uh, mechanical solidarity in that hijab. And that kind of uh, transcends that field, science, everything. So that, that issue brings an additional source of power for them against the regime. And just to kind of conclude for you, we have had tensions uh, continuously between Iran and the international community since 1979. Um, Somebody asked me, how do you describe that? And I said, uh, um, because the abbreviation of the Islamic Republic of Iran is IR, uh, IRI, and I call it Impossible Republic of Iran, the same abbreviation. And it is Impossible Republic of Iran. Um, they have managed to 
continue what I call um, probably the best uh, term for it is organized chaos. An organized chaos situation in the country. An organized chaos situation in the country, which is maintained by their governing system, factions, continuously ties into an external conflict. And the first external conflict was the hostage crisis in November. The second conflict was the war with Iraq. Now, that war did not need to last eight years. That war start by, started by Saddam, could have been ended in 1982, but the regime said no, we gotta pursue it until Saddam is overthrown. <laughs> then, after they finally realized that Saddam is not gonna be overthrown, they have to accept the reality, a ceasefire, next year they declare Fatwa on Salman Rushdie. <laughs> and then the Fatwa on Salman Rushdie keeps that international tensions going, and finally, the situation with the United States. The situation with the United States is one of the strangest relationships because if you think about it, the current supreme leader of Iran um, uh, has been in power since 1989. He actually came to power in 1981. Can you add how many American presidents he has seen? Can you just think about since he's been in power in 81, how many American presidents he has seen come and go? And can you just look at it and see how that experience could give him a different picture of America? It gives him a different picture of America because as much as we are captivated by every four-year election, every eight-year election, this man is not impressed by that. This man is looking at overall American policy approach since Jimmy Carter. And as far as he's concerned, nothing has changed. That kind of explains why U.S. has a hard time understanding Iran. It has a hard time understanding Iran because in this country, we go through this experience of changes in government. We think by voting in and voting out, we declare a, a society's preference, and yet over there, they're looking at this thing, they see it, frankly speaking, as a show. <laughs> and if Trump came to power, they said, wow, Trump. He's great, he's a businessman, we can make a deal with. And if Trump left power, they said, oh, he deserved it because he didn't make a deal with us. <laughs> and there is always a justification. It is always a justification. So read your history books. Go read this book, Republics of Myth, by Hossein Banai and the late John Thurman. This book is a fantastic book that explains the narrative of image making in front of each other. So Washington has created an image of Iranians for themselves. Iranians have created an image of Americans for themselves. In political science IR, they call it mirror imaging. This is the book to read if you want to understand that tension that I think is important. Finally, after all those protests, after uprisings, we in America are used to seeing something as failure success, and we see it as a failure if six months of protest didn't get anywhere. We say, oh wow, that was a big failure. Now we should have done this. But there has been permanent impact of what has happened to Iranian society. State society relations, repeated protests, has created these impacts that 45 years after the 79 revolution, we have anti-clericalism in Iran. We have a serious anti-clericalism movement in Iran. Iranian clerics do not wear the religious garb when they come in the streets. If they come, taxis will not give them rights. The religious clerics will not go to any government offices if they need it, because they look at that technocrat behind the screen, that technocrat is not gonna make it easy for them. And that, what I call anti-clericalism, is a serious development in that country. Why? Because altogether there are about 50,000 clerics in Iran. Not every one of those 50,000 had a role in what is happening in this country. Not every one of those religious leaders agreed with what is happening. But unfortunately, if something begins to happen, I think all of them are going to become the focus. Youth alienation. Uh, we saw the president. Talk to every young Iranian today. 
they have zero confidence in that government, zero confidence in job creation, zero confidence in peacemaking, zero confidence in uh, societal stability. They have zero confidence. They will not believe any solution that government puts forward. So we, we have a serious alienation problem. And finally, um, uh, I think what is really serious is the rising secularism in Iran. The rising secularism is uh, secularism from below up. And when it gets to the top, it is translated as anti-clericalism. At below level, it is translated as total rejection of the Islamic system. And this secularism could be serious later because uh, it could be serious because religious institutions of Shia religion are not just in Iran. They are in Najaf, Iraq. They are in North, in Central Asia. They are in Rome. Those religious institutions see it as their uh, important obligations to maintain the influence of religion over people. So when you, when you look at that rising secularism, you've got to put something in front of it. Rising tension between religious institutions and leaders inside and outside Iran and Iranian society. And finally, rampant corruption, which everybody read. So there has been permanent impact of the protest movement. Yes, um, if you add all the human rights report, all the UN studies on protests from 79 to present, do you know how many people the regime has arrested in 45 years? 1.7 million. As a whole, this is according to them, 1.7 million people they've arrested since 1979, but look where they are. They've created even more apathy and all that. So here, um, I will end with this slide because um, I talked a lot about internal issues, complications, what is going on. We have to also uh, acknowledge how difficult it is to manage a country like Iran. It, we, yes, we have a lot of criticism of the regime, all the same, but it's a complicated country to manage. Um, many people don't know Iran has 15 neighbors, <laughs> 15 neighbors, land and sea boundaries. Do any of those neighbors get along with Iran? Can you mention one of the neighbors get, gets along with Iran? And I would, then I will give you an A, well, with the permission of Professor Mikhail, I will give you an A if you can mention one of the countries that gets along with Iran. None, none of them get along with Iran. So you have to always look at Iran in terms of that forest that I mentioned to you. Look at everything, then go back to the basic elements, look at geography. Before 1991, the breakdown of the Soviet Union, Iran had one northern neighbor, Soviet Union. Today, they have six northern neighbors. Before the withdrawal of the British forces from Persian Gulf in 71, Iran had two neighbors in Persian Gulf, Saudi Arabia and the British press. Today, they have six neighbors in Persian Gulf. So it is a complicated situation. It is a complicated situation. We have to definitely see um, how this complicated situation requires more reading. We have to bring up ourselves up to date on those books that I mentioned to you, Republic of Europe, but we have to also bring uh, each other up to date about Iranian diaspora. It is a major, major element today. Five million Iranians live in 70 countries. Just think about it. This was such an important project that our institute, we went with uh, Professor Shahabi, a very well-known scholar. We commissioned a study, and it's available for free on our website. Go download it. You will see Iranians everywhere from Australia to Central African Republic to Rwanda to Latin America, and they are publishing, engaged in many, they are influencing global affairs behind the scenes. And it is not through the protest in movement in Iran. You have to, again, take that macro picture. You have to look at it and see Iranian diaspora, yes. Some of them came, came here on TV, like Masih Alinejad, and called for overthrow of the regime. And Masih Alinejad is one out of the five million. One out of the five million. So you have to get the bigger picture. If you understand that the five million Iranians outside of Iran, what they're doing, you have a better understanding of Iran today. And so thank you very much for
Um, the lecture today, uh, I, I, I will make my slides available to you. I have some information for you about uh, suggested readings. So I will end there and uh, hope that you keep your interest about Iran and continue reading about it. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for a really informative presentation. Uh, we do have 20 minutes uh, for discussion. Uh, I would like to invite you, if you do have a question for Professor Bakhtiari, uh, to just raise your hand. Nate is in the back, uh, and he'll bring you a microphone. Uh, when you receive the, the mic, just stand, tell us who you are. If you're a student, let us know what you study, uh, and we will go until 1 p.m. Uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, Dr. Bakhtiari. I'm uh, the Persian uh, teacher here at uh, BYU. And I wanted to ask you what your um, opinion is on the current U.S. policy of sanctions against Iran. Um, they've been in place for a long time, and I, I wanted to get your opinion on are, are they effective? Should they be changed? And how, how they have impacted uh, uh, the way Iran looks uh, today? Thank you. That's a very important question. Um, I cannot um, give an opinion um, on the importance of sanction, not the importance of sanction, because I'm not an economist. I think that requires a kind of an economist assessment of understanding economic relations, embargoes, and also not to forget sanction busting. <laughs> and how the, so keeping that in mind, I can tell you a couple of things about sanctions. Um, American sanctions have been in place since uh, November 1979. And the purpose of sanctions, if you read any international relation book, is that sanctions are viewed as another form of regime behavior change, short of conflict and war. Now, the first question I would ask, we have had sanctions on Iran for 45 years. Do you see a change of behavior? That's the first question I would ask you. The second aspect of sanction that I will tell you is that um, sanctions, if they are effective, uh, for example, on South Africa, for example, on other case studies, it has to be a universal, internationally agreed. There's got to be a consensus. All of if you look at the sanctions on Iran, uh, for example, just the U.S. case, U.S. put sanctions first on Iranian oil, pistachio, caviar, carpets, and some, some of the things we look at it at that time, it's like, what, what is a sanction on caviar and carpet? That's how we started. Then, during the war with Iraq, we said, oh, that's, that was a terrible list of sanctions. We got to add to it. We got to put sanctions on their missiles, on their arms, on their uh, resources. So during the war, we instituted more sanctions regarding that. And then suddenly, Salman Rushdie came. Fatwa. They said, oh, this is another, so we got to put more sanctions on them on the fatwa. <laughs> so they included more sanctions that impacted educational exchanges, cultural stuff, relations on visas. They didn't give any more visas to any Islamic scholars coming to U.S. unless they knew he's against that fatwa. So that, and finally, in 1995, um, Iranian um, regime under Rafsanjani was very smart. They had started negotiations with a Conoco oil company in Texas behind the scene. And Rafsanjani at that time sent a message to Conoco Oil that if you come, help us with expansion of our field, we give you some like 50% of profit, some, some hugely attractive deal. And just typical of our oil companies here, they jumped on it, right? They said, wow. So Conoco Oil was engaged in negotiations and then suddenly, Bill Clinton uh, declared, they called it secondary sanctions. They kicked Conoco out of the thing, and we instituted what is called secondary sanction. Secondary sanction means even if you are a non-American and help with Iran, you will be sanctioned. That's called secondary sanction. All of that started now. Um, now, God bless Trump's um, spirit and energy. He came up with more sanctions in uh, 216, 217, he came up with this ridiculous sanction called Muslim ban. 
right? Muslim ban. Do you know that Muslim ban, how many countries it applied to? Just think about it. A Muslim ban was not a Muslim ban on Saudis, but Iran was a part of it, Sudan. So, technically speaking, those of you who know a little bit about September 11, if that Muslim ban was in place in September 2, Osama bin Laden would have been in this country. That Muslim ban did not include a person like Osama bin Laden. So it was so political, so um, um, designed to kind of make a political issue. So this is what we have today, right? This is what we have. So ask yourself the question, for example, um, there are two million Iranians in the United States. Have they been contributing more to American economy, or are they the type that deserve to be sanctioned. Think about it. As far as I know, every Iranian in this country is either educated. I mean, let me. How many of you know about this uh, Iranian uh, space uh, uh, astronaut, um, Mokbeli? Jason Mokbeli is in space. And let me see if I have that slide. I wanted to show them. Okay, this is it. She's in space. Do you know what she did uh, a couple of weeks ago? She put all the drawings of Iranian school children sent to her from Iran about how much they like her. <laughs> right there. It's right there on the top of the paintings. And boy, that was a tough message to Trumpists and others. <laughs> I mean, so when I saw that, I said, wow, that's a powerful way of emphasizing your uh, connection. So sanctions... To answer your questions, have had zero impact. Um, sanctions are unfair because it doesn't include the contributions of the diaspora, and they need to be in touch with their families in Iran. They don't in con uh, include that. And sanctions on Iran and Iranians have been a total failure. To be a total failure, now what, what do I recommend? As I'll tell you, I have no idea. But I think if I were if you put a sanction policy of the United States into any political science 100 class, and that, they, that sanction policy would immediately get a failure grade. Um, yes. I just, I have so many questions for you, and I really um, love Iran and the people from there. And it's such a paradoxical place because I feel like the important cultural undercurrents are so similar between America and Iran. And there's such tremendous pride and love for their country, obviously, aside from the regime and their history. But I, yeah, that's beautiful. I wanted to ask you, though, what it was like for you as a young person, both in high school and then as a university student in the U.S. during all this time. Like, just how was your personal experience? Well, if you ask that, if, if my parents have to ask that question, they would not be happy with my answers because they funded my education and I joined the Confederation of Iranian Students opposing the Shah. They did not like that. And the second thing from my experience that I think was very unique, I, uh, I studied philosophy and political science as an undergraduate. For an Iranian group of students, more, mostly oil, petroleum major, civil engineering. I was very few one that wrote my, uh, my thesis, my undergraduate thesis on Marx and Freud. <laughs> and kind of uh, my parents were very worried about that. They said, they're going to arrest him if he comes to you. <laughs> so my experience has been very different. I would not say it's generalizing, but my experience has been that I came here as a young high school student. I came here for my 11th grade. They sent me to a boarding school. I did not speak English. Now, many of you don't remember, at that time, they didn't have ELS. We did not have English as a second language at that time. So they would take you, put you in a class called biology, and say, learn it. <laughs> and so I uh, had to learn it. The second thing that kind of uh, helped me a lot was sports. I uh, was part of the football team. I played as a wide receiver. And all my football friends helped me with my homeworks, with everything. And the more successful I perform as a football player, 
the, the more successful they sound. Right? So even today in our institute, many people ask me, why do you guys have a program called Sport and Friendship? That is a program that is very close to my heart, and I think through sport, we can build a lot of friendship. Sports create that solidarity, that engagement. So we have this program called Sports and International Friendship. We have a, uh, we have a fellowship called Ambassadors of Wrestling, etc. Our uh, wrestling ambassador next year is going to be Adeline Gray. Just Google her, Adeline Gray. She's a six-time gold medalist three times Olympic gold medalist, and she loves Iran. And you say, she's from Colorado. Why do you think she loves Iran? Because in Las Vegas in 2015, when she won the gold medal, an Iranian philanthropist gave her the gold medal. She has never forgotten that. She loves Iran because she saw that Iranian philanthropist, Semnani, Kaz Semnani, put so much money in the wrestling, supported her, and an Iranian gave her that medal. So today, she was in one of our webinars, and she said, I, I love it. I want to become your ambassador of your institute. So I think engagements of that question is like yours is very important. We need to kind of look for personal engagement, share the experiences, and then come up with alternative messages for U.S.-Iran relations. I think the challenge for us is to maintain a positive approach. At the same time, stay critical of the other side. I mean, don't give up criticism, but stay positive. And my advice is to everyone from my experience from before and after is, can be summarized in one sentence. Um, before the revolution, nobody thought anything negative happening in Iran. And I was living it. They loved us, they loved us. After the revolution, they cannot think of anything positive happening inside you. So this dichotomy, you need to step out of it because there were negative stuff happening in Iran before it. And today, there are positive stuff happening in Iran. That student population is a huge asset. That uh, reinvigorated women population is a huge asset. So I think those are the positive messages one has to look at. And, our goal in our institute is to emphasize what has been positive. This uh, mural that we have designed, do you know the first Iranian students that came to Utah, what year it was? 1923. Do you know what city they went to? Just You will understand that. They went to Logan. And if you go look at some of their memoirs and all that, they are so amazed that Logan doesn't have a campus, they write. It's a farm. But since, since uh, 1923, do you know how many graduates Utah State has had, Iranians? 19,000. Utah State has the largest Iranian alumni population than any university in this country. So that is, that is a huge, so this mural that we designed um, I think if you turn the lights off, you could see the BYU contribution on the bottom. If you reduce the light a little bit. Come on. Oh, there's a cougar right there. So, oh, right there. That's it. So, how many BYU contributions do you own? We have got BYU's contribution, contribution in establishing a teacher's college in Iran in 1962. If you go to your library and Google Iran file, BYU, a huge Iran file shows up. BYU has had a great relationships with Iranian people. And we designed that as a teacher's uh, element here that shows that every university in Utah had a contribution toward Iran. Utah State had water management, et cetera. Um, BYU had teachers, uh, U of U had uh, nursing, medical contributions, and Southern Utah University, believe it or not, had the educational psychology contribution. And we have brought all of them together as a John Whitstow table of friendship because John Whitstow was a Utah president, thinker, who 
we owe everything to him because of Iran. And we owe everything to him because of Iran because he was the one who met an Iranian in an agricultural conference in Canada. And John Whistler, being very intellectual, convinced this Iranian in that conference that you need to come to Utah because Utah is like Iran. Dry land agriculture, you need to come there. So another amazing history, the positive history that you talked about is go find out who gave the commencement address in Logan in 1915, an Iranian did. An Iranian uh, did gave the commencement address in 1915. That is all to the vision of John Whitside. So we created this table of French. So I think there is a lot we can do. There is a lot you guys can do. Just the fact that you're learning Persian, just the fact you're maintaining the cultural relationship, connecting to each other, that is a huge positive impact. Yes, please, please, ask a tough question. Yeah. So, um, you talked a little bit about how things have been changing in Iran. More secularism, more corruption. Uh, the youth are less invested into the regime. Uh, in the past 18 months, uh, since the death of Mahsa Amini, and really quite remarkable set of protests that took place in the, the months after that, there were a number of commentators that said, I don't know, maybe this is it. Maybe this is the, the time when the regime can't, can't uh, keep this under control. Uh, and there have been people saying things since then that say something fundamentally has broken between the population and the regime that may not even be repaired. I'm wondering if you could just share a little bit as to what you see uh, has changed in the last Iran that uh, might help us understand the future of Iran going forward. Well, thank you. That's a very good question. I think uh, what we have to look at is that Iranian society, class system, and the system of what we call uh, bifurcations of what determines my interest versus her interest, his interest, today Iran is not as unified when it comes to centralized economic demands from the regime. Now, some have benefited. Some in the middle class have benefited. So when they saw these riots, these protests outside their homes, they identified with them, but they did not join it. They did not come out and join it. So unfortunately, you had a um, lot of brave people, women, who went into the streets. They burned the scarf. They created situation called for the death of the supreme leader, everything. But overall, in that whole period, the larger portions of the population did not join it, like 79. They did not join it. So that's one reason that it didn't get him. The second element is that there were no central figure of opposition. In 1979, you had this religious leader who emerged as undisputed leader of the opposition. Everybody, even though they did not get along with each other, they said, we are opposed to the Shah so much, we want him. So in this period of protest movement, we did not have leaders. The leaders that emerged were kind of a, uh, eclectic TV personalities, if I can put it, emerged. And then you have this young son, this young son of the former Shah, who, uh, came to this country to be trained as a pilot, and now he's stuck here, and then they went to him and said, well, emerge it. And so you have that changes in Iranian society that they don't even remember the 1979 revolution. They don't even remember the monarchy. <laughs> so it was a total disaster, because even the opposition group outside could not get his act together. So all of those factors kind of uh, make it difficult for a protest movement to take off and not having an alternative. What is the alternative? Suppose you get rid of that terrible governing system that I mentioned to you. Living in that neighborhood, what is the alternative? And so many of the people in the population, they looked at that and said, 
gee, this is uh, not really, do we want to have ISIS here? <laughs> do we want Iran to become another Syria? So those are legitimate questions, I think. And once begin to understand, you understand that it is not negative on the Iranian people not to join the protest, right? It is understanding their perspective, that the protest did not fit their overall goals. Um, so that's why we have this similar. Now, maybe, uh, maybe uh, if you ask me as a political scientist, and um, some, sometimes people ask me, how do you classify the Iranian regime? And I know this is a, this is a favorite question of political scientists. As soon as you talk about it, they say, how do you classify that? Is it authoritarian? Is it totalitarian? Is it a theocracy? And I always think that even in political scientists, we have a problem. No, it's none of them. <laughs> it's a factionocracy. <laughs> the system in Iran is a factionocracy. It has some theocracy in it, some secularism. It is not a theocratic regime. If it was a theocratic regime, this, this country would become another North Korea of Islamic Republic, believe me. They could have easily implemented the Islamic law. It is not a theocratic regime. It's not an authoritarian regime because the leaders of the country don't get along. <laughs> so you have this horizontal. So it is a complicated question. So besides questioning our assumptions in terms of perceptions of Iran, we have to also look at carefully about some of those theoretical uh, information we receive about Iran. And Iran, to me, I, the best I can call it is an impossible republic. <laughs> And the closest I can come to this impossible republic is if they push me, push me, I say, well, the only thing I can see is an implosion, not a revolution. I think the possibility of an implosion within that system is stronger. And with the implosion, there could be people within the system who could transition out and make it more possible. I would say, um, like Franco's regime in Spain. Franco's regime in Spain is maybe a good example to transition to. Our, so we have to look at models like that and kind of get a much more sophisticated picture of Iran. I hope I answered your question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.